Today on the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop, turn Live Edge Lumber into a stunning shadow box frame. The Appalachian Heritage Woodshop is brought to you by Christian Internet Services, common sense internet marketing and web design. Our internet marketing commissions are based on results. Robinson and Mackle, thinking business, practicing law. Waterlock's unique tongue oil and resin blend stains, sealers, and finishes. The go-to finish for wood enthusiasts since 1910. Appalachia covers over 200,000 square miles across 13 eastern states where you will find steep, rugged mountains, vast, lush forests, swift-moving streams, and valley farmland. Appalachian settlers were a unique breed. Isolated by the rough terrain, mountain dwellers had to be self-reliant and innovative to survive the harsh living conditions. One thing Appalachia had always been blessed with was trees until around 1900. Around that time, much of the area was severely damaged from clear-cutting most of the forest in the name of progress. Thankfully, with long-term conservation efforts, timber and wildlife have been reestablished. Careful forest management allow woodworkers and hunters to enjoy their hobbies once again. This is Gerald Vance with the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop. Many people think live edge furniture is a new concept. In reality, in the Appalachian region, live edge has been used for several generations. They've used live edge chestnut, oak, cherry, beech, maple, walnut. There's several different native species that they would harvest and they would use the live edge rather than discarding it. This is an example of a live edge shadow box that I designed. This is cherry, nice live edge on the outside, mitered corners. And the shadow box is wormy chestnut harvested from an old barn. And here you can see walnut, live edge, mitered corners. And over here is sycamore. It also is live edge. Both of these have wormy chestnut as the shadow box. Now the Appalachian people would use a shadow box to display an item that they cherished. And an example would be a turkey feather. Today we have a special guest, Brent Curry, who's going to show us how to paint a turkey feather. So stay tuned with the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop, and I'll show you how to build a live edge picture frame. This is Gerald Lance with the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop. I'm with Brent Curry in my shop in Cabell County, West Virginia. Brent is from Kanawha County, West Virginia. Brent, thanks for coming by. Oh, anytime, Uncle Gerald. I, I appreciate the opportunity to come down here and do this. And right now you're a student at WVU? I am. What I'm kind in, of program are you taking? I'm in fisheries and wildlife resources. Now the people that harvest turkey, they like to keep the tail feathers or the spurs. That's, that's right. Um, they make a, a good static display. And it's just a way, and for most hunters, it's just a way to, to memorize a hunt. A turkey is not something that you would typically do a shoulder mount or a, a full body mount on. No, it is done. Most commonly, a, a hunter will cut the tail, the tail fan off and place it on the wall after some curing and right. um, And that I process. know some, some people will collect the individual feathers and paint on them like you're doing here. Yeah, uh, so this, this came about from a mishap from a, uh, uh, a failed taxidermy attempt on my part. On, the tail on, a, on a tail fan. I tried to mount a tail fan myself and I left it outside in a, an area where wild game could get to it. And I walked out one day and uh, turkey tail feathers were all over the ground. So I just decided yeah. to make the best use of, use of them. So I started painting them. It doesn't matter if you're using hand tools or machinery in your shop. You need to know the safe way to operate your equipment. Make certain you have the proper safety equipment 
and most importantly, use your PPE. Be safe and enjoy your shop time. Here is the Live Edge shadow box that I built here in the Appalachian Heritage Wood Shop. This particular shadow box contains a turkey feather with a hand-painted deer scene on it. If you notice, the Live Edge is sycamore. It's got a nice little knot in it here and some nice contour. The shadow box is wormy chestnut. So let me set this aside and I'll show you how I'm going to make another one of these. I'm going to start with some wormy chestnut. This is enough to do the shadow box. I'll have to dimension this and rip it in half and that'll give me the four pieces for the shadow box. And I've got two live edge pieces of cherry which I will be using for the live edge frame. Now if you notice this, it's got some real nice grain on it. And of course it has a live edge. And when I do a live edge, what I like to do is take a straight edge and lay down on the board and look and make sure I've got about the same amount at the maximum overhang. So I think that looks good. And then I just draw a line. That'll be my reference line, which I will cut on the bandsaw. This will give me enough for a short piece and a short piece on the picture frame. And I have another piece of cherry over here and I'll do the same with it. So let's get started. Here's a nice piece of wormy chestnut that I got from a barn. Anytime I used wood that's been uh, recycled from a barn, I prefer to go over it with a metal detector and make certain there's no metal in it. And I'll show you here, there's a cut nail and a box nail. And you can see it picks up metal pretty quick. So I've gone over this. Uh, there is no metal in this. The other thing I like to do is take an ice pick and look at any of the wormholes and I make sure there's no uh, dirt, mud, or even uh, bugs down in the wormholes. Uh, when I run this over the planer or joiner, it can dull the knives if it has mud in there. Uh, it can also do the same with a uh, blade on a table saw. So I've already prepared this board, so I'm ready to take this to the joiner and run across the joiner to get me a flat surface. Now over to the thickness planer. There's a good straight edge. Okay, I've run this through the joiner and the planer and I've created a nice straight edge on the joiner, so now I'm ready to rip this to the correct width. I've got the uh, height of the blade adjusted properly. I've moved the blade guard out of the way so you can see this operation. And I'm gonna set my table saw for two and a quarter inches. And now I'm ready to rip. Now I've already square cut one end. I have a stop block set up on the fence at the right position. So now I'm ready to cross cut and cut all of these to the right dimension. The shadow box is put together with a simple rabbit joint on the corners. So for that, I'm gonna use a dado blade and a table saw. I've got my miter gauge set up and a stop block 
so all of the rabbits will be the same size. Now the rabbits get cut in the long side and not the short side. So let's go ahead and make those now. Now I need to cut a rabbit groove on the back so I can put the back in. And I've got the fence set up. The dado blade is at the same height. Move the fence in so now I'm ready to create those grooves. Now I've repositioned the fence so I can cut a groove which will accept the glass it goes in the front. Make certain you know the exact thickness of the glass or the polycarbonate you're going to use. What I'm going to use is one eighth of an inch thick, so I've set the fence for that. And I'm ready to make those. There's the groove for the glass. Okay, now I'm ready to glue and nail the shadow box frame together. I'm just going to use some uh, PVA glue and I'm going to use some brad nails. Now this is wormy chestnut and you can see a lot of the worm holes here. So that's one thing that is really to my advantage in using a brad nailer on a project like this. I don't have to worry about the hole from the brad. So that's good. However, I do have to worry about the light reflecting off of the head of the brad that is down in the hole. But in order to keep it from doing that, I take a marker and just coat the head of the brads with a little bit of black ink and the light will not reflect off of it. So that's a nice tip. The other thing is when I go to nail this together, I need to pay attention because the brads have a tendency to deflect if they hit a knot or something hard, they will deflect to the side of the gun and not to the front or the back of the gun. So I need to use that to my advantage. So that means if I hold the gun this direction and fire it, if the brad deflects, it stays in the wood if I have it turned up this way and shoot into it and it deflects, then it can blow out the end and that's what you don't want. Now I've already done the dry fit. Uh, I like to put it in clamps and make sure everything is right before I actually apply glue. I've already done that, everything is set up right. So now I'm ready to apply just a little bit of glue. And you wanna be careful and not get the glue wherever you're gonna have the back or the glass. So you don't want any squeeze out on that if you can keep from it. Okay, now I've got that shot together real good. Now I'm going to go ahead and put some clamps on it just to make sure I got plenty of pressure and get good contact where the glue is. And I like to make certain that it is square. And it's right on. So now I just need to let the glue dry. While the uh, glue is drying on this, I'm going to work on the live edge frame that goes on top of this. Now I've already marked where I want to rip off the live edge. And I'm going to do that here at the bandsaw. It's a lot safer that way. Okay, now I'm ready to create a flat surface on one face of the board. And the joiner is the best tool for that.
Okay, now I'm ready to run these through the thickness planer. First thing I want to do is measure the thickness I'm at now. And then set the depth. Now I'm ready to joint one edge. If you remember, this was cut on a bandsaw, so it's not very straight. Now some of you are probably wondering why I did not joint this edge when I jointed one face. And there is a reason. With the live edge, I have to have the live edge up. And when I jointed one face, that face has to be against the fence. And that means I may be going against the grain. If I joint one face and then plane the other, then it doesn't matter which face goes against the fence. I can go by the proper direction of the grain. So now let's go ahead and joint this one edge. Now you've probably noticed that some places the bark is missing some places the bark is still intact. Because there is such a small amount of bark left, I'm going to remove all the bark. Now when it comes to removing the bark, whatever works the best is usually what I do. I've got scrapers, files, glue scrapers, wire brushes, just whatever it takes to get it off. This should come off pretty quick. Uh, sometimes I even use a pocket knife. But most of this as you can see, it comes off pretty easy. And then it's just a matter of cleaning it up. There you go, now I'm ready to cut the miters. Now I've just got finished cutting all the miters on the live edge cherry. So now let's take it over to the workbench and I'll show you how I assemble. Okay, now I'm ready to assemble my picture frame. Before I do, I wanted to show you a little bit about a miter joint. If you look real close, you can see quite a bit of end grain on the miter cut. And the end grain is not very strong holding uh, with only glue. It is very much like a butt joint. So I like to reinforce my miter joints. So I reinforce them with a spline. And in this case, it's going to be a hidden spline because I don't want to detract from the natural live edge. So I'm going to use a biscuit. This is a number 20 beach biscuit. Uh, it is compressed in the manufacturing process. So when it gets wet, the moisture from the glue will cause it to swell up and it'll lock into place. So what I like to do is align the inside corner on this miter frame. And once I do that, then I'll put a pencil mark halfway across the miter joint. Now if you've noticed, I've numbered every one of the corners so that I put them back in the same place. Now this pencil mark halfway is so that I can align my biscuit joiner when I make the cut. <clears throat> so let me show you how that's done. I've already got the depth set and I've got it set for a number 20 biscuit. And I've got this one clamped into place. And there you can see the slot and the biscuit fits down in it like that. Okay, I'm going to use a band clamp as well as some other clamps. And I've got to get uh, glue down inside the slots where the biscuits go.
I've already glued up the live edge picture frame. I've sanded it and cleaned up the uh, live edge. So uh, now I'm ready to assemble it. Before I assemble, I want to apply a finish to both the picture frame and the shadow box. It is easier to apply the finish before I assemble it because with the glass in it, I have trouble getting the finish on it and keeping it off the glass. So I'd rather apply the finish to the two pieces and then put it together. So what I've got, I've got some oil varnish blend and I've added a little bit of red collar to it for the cherry live edge frame and some natural collared oil varnish blend for the shadow box. And I like to apply it with a rag. And for this, what I want to do is let it soak in and keep the surface wet for about 15 minutes. Now because of the beautiful grain, it will soak in at different rates. So that means it will dry in some areas and not others. So I have to keep it wet all over for about 15 minutes. Now when I turn it over, I'm going to use some of these little manufactured devices that hold it up off of the paper. Now, if you notice, there's some blue tape right here. On the back side, I placed the frame on here, leaving about a half inch exposed on the inside, drew a line around it, and I put some painter's tape on the inside of those lines. So when I go to glue this together, the glue will adhere to the bare wood and not have the oil varnish uh, between the wood and the glue. So I'm just going to apply this right over top of the tape. Again, keeping it wet and letting it soak in. This really makes the grain stand out. And of course, I need to get the live edge, and that takes a little bit of time for that because it's so irregular. As you can see, I like to use a little bit of craft paper on top of my workbench so I don't have any excess drip onto my workbench. I need to go around it one more time and make sure I don't have any dry spots or I don't have any accumulation or puddles. That really makes that grain stand out. This wormy chestnut is a very beautiful wood. It's a wood that's harder and harder to find now because all of the chestnut, American chestnut trees were killed by a blight a long time ago. So about the only place you can get it now is reclaimed from old barns and houses. And this uh, dry wood, it really soaks in. So while that's drying, I'm going to go over to the table saw and I'll cut the back and the front uh, for our shadow box picture frame. Okay, I've got the table saw set up. I'm ready to rip the back to the right size. I buy polycarbonate in large sheets and then cut it to the size I need. I cut it here at the table saw. If you don't feel comfortable using the table saw, use the band saw. Now when you cut polycarbonate, you need to be aware that the, the friction builds up a tremendous amount of heat and it can actually melt and fuse it back together. So when you cut it, you need to make certain that you 
keep it moving and move at a constant rate. Make sure that you have on eyeglasses so that none of this gets in your eye. Okay, I've just removed the clamps and now I'm ready to put the back on. Now, normally the back would be covered with some type of a material, but for this, I don't know what the client's going to put in it. So I'm going to put the back in without wrapping it in a material. So the back just fits into the frame. And then I use a Frame Master point driver. And I like to just barely angle it and shoot it in. Now the reason I like to slightly angle it, it makes it easier to get these frame points back out. And these need to come out in order to take the back off to put whatever is going to go inside the frame. So that's how that's done. So there you can see the finished product. It can be portrait or landscape. If you're interested in any information or plans on any of the items featured on the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop, just check out our website, AppalachianHeritageWoodshop.com. Remember, be proud of your Appalachian heritage.